Hi everyone, my name is Evian Abdegir and I consider myself a multimedia journalist. I got my start in hands-on journalism actually at CJRU where I started as a volunteer um, news reporter. And then I started working at the Toronto Star's radio room program. And around that time I was also volunteering at CJRU and then eventually I got a role as the music director and that was really fun because my intro to published writing was music criticism. So it just felt natural to me. And I think of just generally my journalism experience as having had the opportunity to really get a taste of everything. I've worked in broadcast radio at the CBC, and then I've also worked in podcasting at Frontburner. And recently I was working at a production company called Antica Productions. So I started volunteering at CGRU while going to Ryerson, um, looking for some audio audio chops, some, some more technical skills. Um, and I totally got that at CGRU. Um, and just a lot of opportunity to create um, and pursue my creativity. And CJR, you pretty much lined me up with my very first job out of school, which was uh, at a, a, basically a think tank, kind of a research group that was based out of Ryerson and was looking for someone to produce a podcast for them and reached out, they, they put the p job posting through CJRU. Uh, at the time, I think I was working as the community outreach liaison. So, um, yeah, so CJR, you really, really helped me, um, both in terms of the skills and the actual opportunity to do what I'm doing now, which is uh, almost exclusively podcast production. Sometimes there's some other kinds of, of media that I'm creating, like webcasts um, or kind of video cast ask things um, mostly with exclusively actually um, branded work. Some of that being through my company, which I call Voice Magic, and some of it being through um, the Walrus Lab, which is kind of the branded content arm of the Walrus. Um, yeah, I think that's probably enough to, to get it started on my end. Hi everyone, um, so I'm Lauren. And I started volunteering for community radio when I did my undergrad when I was at Carleton um, in Ottawa. So I was at CKCU and it's sort of when I started falling in love with st storytelling through audio and also through school, I learned video. So I knew sort of that's what I wanted to do. And then after some soul searching, I figured out I wanted to do my master's in documentary media at Ryerson. So that's how I got into the Ryerson community. And through there, um, Actually, one of my classmates who was a year ahead of me was the current volunteer coordinator for CJRU. And so I kind of knew what was going on and then um, the job came up. So I thought, what a, what a good time to get back in the community radio. And so I applied and then through that job, I was able to contribute to a bunch of different um, projects and events that went on through CJRU. Um, and it gave me, a good background for what I'm doing now and I learned how you know to manage things I learned how to teach people how to do audio I learned how to create community events that partnered with radio creation and audio creation um, but when I finished school I really wanted to go into film and I was lucky enough to work freelance basically um, where I did audio recording, I did cinematography, <laughs> I've been an editor, <laughs> I got really into photography, um, just sort of honing my skills on all these different things. And then I knew I wanted to move out west, so I'm actually in Squamish, BC. And when I moved here, I didn't have all those connections. So I was sort of starting from scratch, but there was a big market of filmmakers and editors, but there was not a big market in audio producers. So I ended up connecting with people who needed podcast production work. And that's sort of how I've made my connections out here. And right now I'm actually the associate producer and editor for Parks Canada, and I'm setting up their whole podcasting department. So I'm teaching all of these people how to do podcasting. Um, and I'm also working on their first ever series and I think a lot of those skills from CJRU, being the volunteer coordinator and being in that 
uh, community really helped me with my role now. My story in community radio started way back when I was like a middle schooler. And um, my school had like this community radio outreach program, I guess, with the local station. And um, yeah, it was a group of us. We were in French immersion and we did this kind of like French radio show. It was probably really terrible French because we were still learning. And um, then that kind of spurred my interest in it. And I ended up getting involved again with the same station in high school and college, like my before I came to Ryerson, this was in British Columbia. And uh, my friend and I had a music show and it was just like the most fun ever. And um, I think that kind of helped me to get to a point where I could come on, be hired by CJRU, just having that community radio background. So I was in third year at Ryerson and I heard that they were starting up the community radio station or the campus radio station at Ryerson. And um, there had been kind of a storied history with the old radio station. They were starting it up a new, this new endeavor. And um, I believe I was like the first person hired by um, former station manager, Jackie. And it was like really kind of helping to build it from the ground up. And it's, I get like so wonderful to see where it is now and all you wonderful people are um, keeping it, you know, alive and thriving. Um, but when I came on at the first, um, that first time I was a volunteer coordinator. And um, after a couple of years, I moved into news director there and um, had a couple roles, I guess, like I managed the, um, the news show there and the news team over a number of years and iterations of that. And then I also started, um, had the show Femme Radio for a while, which was like a small like um, team that was, our goal was kind of like helping more women identified people or non-binary people um, to come into this space and um, engage with podcasting and radio and kind of providing a space where they could, you know, experiment with radio in that that arena so um and then yeah after i guess in 2016 i got a job at the canadian press and it got hard to juggle the two jobs so i ended up doing that um full time yeah thank you um so you guys each of you kind of touched on it but I, i'm curious if we could just elaborate a little bit more so what were some specific goal, uh, skills that you gained while working at CJRU? Like you can get as specific as, as you wanna get specific skills, whether it's directly in the field or even just people skills, like anything that's specific that you gained while at CJRU that you find yourself applying. You still kind of find yourself tapping back into to use um, at your, in your current field. And I know you guys kind of do different things. So even if it's just one area definitely interested to know. Ebian. Sure. <laughs> um, Emily raised like a really important point, which is when she started, um, CGRU wasn't on the air yet. And I was actually trained by Emily, who was like overseeing um, the news shows. So when I became um, the music director, we were like actually on air. So that was the first time where we, I think for myself, I had to think more deeply about like following the CRTC rules and guidelines um, because if it goes online like you can always just like remove and edit it but if it goes to broadcast like it people hear it and I think that's also like practical um, just I think experience that I also had a taste of before I like started interning at the public broadcaster and eventually started working at the CBC in radio it's um it's so important that like as audio nerds that we're thinking of the sound, we're also thinking of like just everything that we are to do to make sure that a show runs. And I think working at CGRU was really like good testing ground. And I think something with um, community radio that is so special is that you have the freedom to experiment. So if you were um, just eager, like you can start your own show. I didn't do that because I was working at the Toronto Stars radio room and this is just like, I guess, sound advice for like any journalist. 
I remember that summer to be like the most difficult of my life because I was so busy. Um, and like Emily, I also had to decide on um, taking on like full-time work and focusing just on journalism. So I'm grateful of the time that I had at CJRU because it really like set me up to be like a professional journalist and to get a good taste of like what broadcast radio is. Thank you. That's amazing. I didn't know that you started basically like on the onset of CJRU um, as a music director. That's you're you're right there at the beginning, like the inse almost the inception. That's pretty cool. And then to kind of continue in that path. Thank you for sharing that. Noah. Yeah, I'll, I'll second something that uh, Abby Ann said um, in terms of uh, the in terms of being creative and trying things um, and community radio being a great uh, kind of testing ground for ideas, but also uh, a place where you can commit to something, commit to a good idea and try to keep it going for a while and kind of enjoy the depth that you can reach with a certain idea. So I think that's, uh, if I were to give, uh, you know, a piece of advice to someone who is new to CGRU, I think it would be to, um, try to have both of those experiences, both, um, you know, uh, picking up hosting shifts on one of CJRU's kind of regular shows and getting a, a broad range of experiences, but also um, when you find a show that really uh, you feel connected to, or maybe it's something that you've pitched and gets accepted, also try to go deep with it and, and keep it going for a while and see where it develops uh, in that way. Um, an, another really useful aspect of my CGRU experience for my work now was uh, volunteer training, um, delivering volunteer training. I, I basically have my presentation slides from that uh, and I used that with clients literally yesterday. I was using it with a client. So um, yeah, so some of the stuff that, um, that you learn at the station, some of the materials you get uh, are you can totally take them and reuse them, tweak them, um, and and use them uh, in a professional setting. I also want to add, sorry, um, working in community. Excuse me, working in community radio is professional experience, and I think that's for me something that I'm so so happy that I had the opportunity to do because not many universities even have like um, like their own community radio. And yeah, I just thought that was interesting. I just wanted to add that. Very good point, for sure. Uh, Lauren. I also have been using a lot of the training uh, that I delivered when I was the volunteer coordinator in my work like right now as I'm talking to people, how to interview people, how to approach people, how to approach a subject. Um, I think one thing that was really cool at CGRU was seeing the process of a show idea becoming to or coming to fruition. There's a lot of different moving parts depending on the type of show you're doing, but there's a lot of different aspects you need to think about. Um, and you don't know exactly what it, that is when you first start. And I think that's a really cool process to go through to see all of these different things that you do need to think about. And you may not have realized that is an important aspect, um, whether that's sourcing who you're gonna speak to, um, equipment, events that are around, what, the focus of the show is going to be right now I'm trying to teach Parks Canada that their ideas are great but they're way too big for a 15 minute episode and we need to really shrink them down so they're digestible. Um, another great thing I think I gained at CJRU is pr project management which again comes with in with all the work that I do. Um, I do a lot of projects that I'm looking to get grants for and funding. There's a web series I'm trying to get off the ground and, you know, figuring out all, like I said, those different aspects where we need to go. Organizing your time, I think is really important, especially if you're juggling a job, school, also volunteer work. I think figuring out what you need to do and when you need to do it and how to have time for yourself at the same time is extremely important so you don't get burnt out. Um, and having all those experiences all at the same time really makes you thankful <laughs> once you have a job. There's not all these other external factors happening. Um, you can really focus on the work that you're doing, but it does set you up for more 
success with the task at hand um, once you're done school. Um, another thing I think is interviewing people. Um, I have gained so much experience through the practice of interviewing people, whether it was for school or CJRU, um, even more so with CJRU because I was able to really you know, talk about the subjects I was interested in, um, do the stories that I wanted to do. And that came through, or that helped with my interviewing skills, figuring out how to make people comfortable, make them you know, personable, have them come across through a medium which is audio only so we don't see them and sort of figuring out the tips and tricks of that to make them an approachable person over um, an audio project. Um, but yeah, those are some things for that question. Thank you. And Emily. I just think it's so incredible to have like a resource for people to um, have like a low barrier, low barriers for entry into radio and to have, to be able to come into a radio station with a cool idea and just have a team of people who are like, yeah, let's do that. It's like so um, special that that's a place where that can happen. And um, you know, you have a studio to record in, you have equipment that you can go and like go out to interviews with and you have, you know, free training and all these things. Um, so I think that's just such a, that's what makes it really special to me. Um, and it really allows people, especially young people who are wanting to get into uh, the radio field or um, journalism, whatever it may be, to build a portfolio in a way that's like, it can sound really good because you have access to that stuff and um, be able to continue in that, um, in that career, like with kind of, I think one thing that was important for me is that I had like, um, you know, a few news shows that I could include and show to um, my future employer at um, CP and just like, look, this is the work I've done in the past. And it sounded okay. Like it was recorded in a studio and everything. And um, also again, like the, the leadership and team management kind of skills. Um, it was definitely like a huge learning process because I had never, like coming in to work at CGRU, I hadn't worked in very many like leadership or um, team management um, uh, positions. And so that was like a really great um, chance for me to, you know, learn how to manage a team and bring everyone in so that we can meet this deadline and um, get those kinds of skills as well. Um, just like people working skills, <laughs> I think were, were really, really important. Um, and um, getting to make um, a lot of connections with people who are really interested and passionate about radio as well, like all of you people. <laughs> so I think um, those were like the biggest things for me. Thank you. So kind of going off of your answer, Emily, um, this is a two part question. So one, if you can kind of think back to that moment when you left CJRU and you went into your first job, um, whether it was that kind of a black and like clean cut or whether it kind of happened, um, you were doing both at the same time. If you could just go back to that time and just tell us what was that transition like? And also uh, something we're curious about is how do you sell a potential employer or a client on volunteer experience when that's maybe all that you have and, and that's what you have to show? Not that it's not, it's lacking, but how do you, you know, how do you sell that client or employer? Back in, uh, I think it was 2016, I... Technically, I graduated from Ryerson in the spring of 2016 because I had taken an extra semester, but I started at CP January 2016, if that makes sense. So I, for a time, I was working and completing school and doing CGRU stuff. And um, the transition after I finished school, I did continue working both at um, CP and CGRU for a while in the news director position. And um, it was um, like, I just love CJRU so much. It was really hard for me to leave. <laughs> and um, it was like my fun job <laughs> and I just uh, really enjoyed it. And so it was kind of difficult for me to take that stuff and be like, okay, I actually I'm struggling with the, the workload, like basically working. It kind of felt like a, a part-time job on top of a full-time job. So um I just kind of did myself a, a favor and moved to just working at 
of the Canadian press. Um, and so the transition for me from, it's kind of hard for me to address coming from a volunteer background because I, ha I was employed by CJRU. Um, so I can only speak to it um, as someone who worked with volunteers, if that makes sense. But um, again, I think having a passion project of that kind where you are, like Noel was kind of saying, you know, you're putting 100% of your love into a project. I think that really shows. Um, if you have a show that you, you know, you put the work into making it sound really good and you want to go and can, it's related to something that you want to go into a, a field or um, um, that kind of route. I think that can be really, really valuable. Um, and um, yeah, just uh, getting kind of, again, that portfolio of work, I think is important to show people that you are, um, you have kind of the goods to back up um, what, where, where you want to go. And I guess also just being like involved with different, like being, I'm sure like everyone on this um, Zoom call, that's why they're here is because they are involved in the radio station and like enjoy making these kinds of connections. So I just think that's really important as well. Um, I will say that I got my current job because a friend from school sent me the posting and you know, if she was an acquaintance from school, um, not even like a close friend, but like someone that knew that I was into radio because I worked with CGRU. So I feel like in, <laughs> at least in my grade, like, or in my year at school, I kind of became like the radio girl because I was associated with CGRU. And so people would send me radio opportunities. <laughs> so I feel like that also really helped, I guess, <laughs> sort of branded myself that way. Thank you. Ebian. Well, starting first with, uh, do you need any um, like paid work to impress employers? And I think the short answer is no. I think just looking at the journalism market right now, there are so few jobs, but we have like a million resources to tell whatever story that we want, whether it's like in podcasting or it's like a multimedia story. Um, I think what people are looking for who have hiring power is the quality of your story and also the uniqueness of your story, like what makes it special. And I think one of the driving factors of that is being really passionate and like the expert on whatever story it is that you want to tell that sets you apart from others. Um, I think that's been pretty consistent um, with my experience in journalism. I started out first um, writing music reviews and doing some criticism for Exclaim. I interned at a publication that no longer exists anymore called Chart Attack. And it was an indie music publication. And one of the earliest tips that I got was to think about really niche stories that bigger places are not going to do because they're there to like break news or tell the stories that everybody like flocks to and like wants to hear. So that advice really stuck with me. Um, in terms of leaving CJRU, honestly, I was like working all the time um, between the Star Radio Room and CJRU that summer. I think I was working like 70 hours. I'm like terrible at math as a journalist. So I didn't realize that. Um, so I, it was just was a natural exit for me that I would like move on to um, focusing on school and then interning at CBC. So that was my exit. And I also didn't mention, but I did have the opportunity to work on a project with the Ryerson School of Journalism and CGRU. This is actually super meta, but it was interviewing Ryerson Journalism School alumni about you know, their early um, experiences in the field and looking back at some work that they did when they're at Ryerson. And that also just gave me really sound advice of just how difficult the industry is, how we're constantly like in this, um, I would say like gig cycle or like gig economy that we are always learning new skills. So I think if there's, I guess more advice to add to that is to be agile and to keep like a tally and score of like all of the new things that you're learning. Because I think journalism is one of those industries 
where your skill set is really transferable. So you don't have to be a journalist like all the time. Like you can take a pause in your career, do something else that might inspire stories um, and then return back to journalism. Thank you. Noah? I have a very, very kind of specific uh, example of that. So when I was uh, volunteering at CGRU, I made a I made a show called Sliced Bread where every episode was about a different sandwich. Um, and I went really, really, really deep on that sandwich in terms of the history of it, the best place to eat it. I went and recorded it. So it was interviews and field recording and scripted. It was like, it. I was spending more time on that than I was on schoolwork, like quite frankly, um, and eating free sandwiches. So it, it worked out. Um, but it was, it was off of sliced bread that I got hired for that, for that job. And they, they were pretty explicit about that. They were like, we really liked your show and we thought it sounded really good. And, uh, we, I mean, we'd like, we'd like you to work on this. So, um, yeah, I, I think, I think th these days, um, you, you, you're, you, you, you gotta, you got to just put in the time and put in the work to make your own portfolio. And then that, that gives you something to, to show. Um, but, you know, being involved in CGRU, you're starting off with a great uh, support network and great resources. Um, so it's, it's a great jumping off point in that way. Thank you. And Lauren. Yeah, so I guess I have less of a clean cut um, than everybody else. When I was at CGRU, I worked a little after, I kept working a little after I graduated, but at the same time, I was also freelancing. So I was working in film um, and I was fortunate enough through my program that I had made a ton of good connections where the work found me. I didn't have to find the work um, and it ranged from, like I mentioned, cinematography to editing to being a sound recordist on set. Um, but then I left CGRU when I moved to Collingwood, Ontario, so I wasn't in Toronto anymore. So um, that's, I just, I was moving. So that's why I left. I didn't want to, but, um, and then while I was there, I was also, I'm still freelancing. Um, I started working on my own project where I started writing grants for it. So grants is, are a very important thing in the media world, especially if you're not wanting to go the journalism route. Um, I don't know how many people might be considering that, but especially when you wanna pursue projects that are not, that are your own and you don't have any financial backing. So I did not have the, I never went to a grant workshop. I should have, That's something I really should have done, but I sort of spent that time. and. I, when I was in Collingwood, um, that was a transition before I moved out west. So I spent that time, you know, learning how to write grants, learning what I really wanted to do. I have a podcast that is my own podcast. It's sort of been shelved right now because of the pandemic. Um, it looks at medically assisted dying. So not the funnest um, subject, but I was supposed to interview a ton of uh, doctors this past summer, but nobody wanted to see me because of COVID. Um, so that's sort of on pause, but that I did write a lot of grants for it and I did get a lot of funding. Um, and right now the funding I got, all uh, the city of Toronto and the city of Ontario or the province of Ontario, they've all been very, you know, uh, helpful during COVID and they understand this problem or the situation. Um, but then I moved to Vancouver or I'm in Squamish, sorry, but close to Vancouver. And when I came here, I didn't have really any connections in media I was starting right from like just fresh like I didn't know anyone um and I was sort of looking for work I was getting little things here and there but then like I mentioned earlier there was a big sort of hole in podcast producing and everyone wants to start a podcast right now <laughs> so I sort of was filling that niche and just through that I started working for Rocky Mountain Books, which is a book publisher out here. And they do a lot of like outdoor stuff, um, environmentally related stuff. And I was like, hey, they posted looking for an audio producer. And I was like, hey, I have all this background. I worked at CGRU. I've done work at Community Radio in Ottawa. 
like this is my what my portfolio looks like and they really didn't ask any questions they're like sounds great uh come on board and then through them I met quite a few other people wanting to do podcasts and then with my current job um I actually got this job because I followed someone on Instagram who had a similar job at Parks Canada and I wanted that job so I connected with him and we chatted about what I did and whatnot jobs popped up they were very high level senior positions and I knew I wasn't going to get them but I messaged him anyway saying I applied and that had been going on for honestly two years and then this past fall he was like hey we're starting a podcast team you should send your resume to my manager and just gave me her email address and then from there it worked out so um honestly I social medias and just making those connections is the most important thing and a lot of those connections I made in Toronto were through projects I've made and talking to people and people really and you know when they see you working on a project they see the person behind the, the finished piece and they really get to see you as a person and, you know, see how great you are. So um, it definitely worked out in my favor. And then using social media, honestly, just stalk the people you want, who have jobs you want and make a connection that way. It's, it's a little different than everybody else, but that's sort of my story. And then in terms of making CDRU, you know, like a real experience. Um, I just say these are my past experiences and I worked, or I worked, I volunteered at a radio station. This is my portfolio. People don't really ask questions. The work speaks for itself. So I don't think it's, I never worried about it. Um, I don't really think people need to worry about it. Just be confident in the work that you've done and present it and I'm sure they'll like it. Well said, thank you. So before we jump into our individual questions that I have for each of you, I do wanna know um, if you can speak on it, what was it like uh, setting your rate for yourself? So when you're going with it, especially if you're freelancing, but irregardless, what was that process like of setting your rate? And um, I guess even for those who have never had to really um, set a rate before for their own work, like it can be very, very daunting. So what advice can you give to that or any support, anything along those lines? Ebian? This is a really hard question to answer because honestly, I don't know the answer. Um, In podcasting, I think there are standard rates, but depending on your experience, depending on the company that you're working for, their budget, that varies. I think a rule of thumb that has been helpful for me is having a network of people who work in journalism who are honest and transparent about how much they've made um, is also is like really helpful just to know um, what like just general transparency just to know what the rates are but also to know um, and I hate to say this but like how companies value their workers like it shows up in the money I think that's a problem in journalism which is rates are really not transparent they're not open Um, But in terms of setting a rate for myself, I've sort of just decided that rate based on what I was paid previously. And then I also like ask around and like evaluate the company that I might want to work for and see like what their budget might be. Um, I do know in branded content rates are a bit higher than they would be um, in like public broadcasting, for example. But also just being really open with the people that you want to work for and just asking them like, what is your typical rate and um, what might you need from me to, you know, um, pay me more or pay or pay me less. Because if you're a journalist, who's like a multimedia journalist, uh, maybe you have like a background in magazine writing that might not translate into podcasting. If they need someone who's like more rich in audio um, and like more technically savvy. So I think it, it always helps to just ask around and, base your rate on that. Thank you. And just before I go pass it to you, Noah, um, for any of the panelists who don't um, freelance or didn't necessarily have to go through that particular process, please feel free to even just speak on what it's like being a new um, journalist or whatnot in the workplace. Noah. Yeah, I completely agree with what Abian said about um, being transparent and um, sharing 
what you've what you've uh, charged different clients with with a, a network of peers. I think that that is really really important um, because people may not realize that they could be charging more. Um, that's kind of the I would say that the biggest reason is to encourage your friends or you know your your peers to to be a bit more aggressive with what they're charging. Um, it, it is really such a complicated and difficult thing to figure out. Um, my first rate came because um, I was working at that job that I got through CGRU. And um, it was basically a kind of communications, uh, communications role and kind of like a, an hourly uh, rate. But really what I wanted to do was just produce podcasts. So we figured out what made the most sense was for me to be a contractor. And, and since then, I, I pretty much, besides working as volunteer coordinator, I haven't had a job. It's always been contract to contract. Um, a couple of things that I will say that I feel pretty strongly about um, is um, don't work uh, at a discount. I think you should really be willing to turn away uh, situ situations where you're not where you're not feeling good about about the pay. My my rule is typically it's either full price or it's free. So if it's if it's something that I feel really passionate about, um, then I need to feel passionate enough about it to do it for free. And if it's something I'm not passionate about, then I I know that I will only feel good about it at the end of the day if I make uh, you know a, a, a rate that is consumerate with the work I put in. I, I don't want to feel like I like I signed myself up for for something that was. Um, I, I also w will say, I mean, it, whenever possible, um, I would recommend not working for individuals, uh, especially when it comes to pay uh, and working for companies. Um, in terms of bad clients. Um, Every bad client I've had has been an individual uh, and I haven't had a single truly bad experience with a company. Um, that's not fully true. I, I have had one client who I, it, you know, it, over a year of legal things, um, but that's by far the exception. Whereas every single kind of individual person, um, when it comes to working with individuals, um, Firstly, the, the money means something very different from them than it does from a company's marketing budget. Um, so it, it's just a little bit more charged um, and, and maybe a little bit less reliable. And, th and then also they're so close to the project and they are so emotionally invested in it. Um, and it, it can be really, really fraught. Uh, I, I would recommend if you are looking for paying gigs, um, definitely look uh, for companies. Um, also, yeah, um, the, the one, one other thing I'd say is when you are offering quotes or when you're coming up with statements of work, uh, pack that line of deliverables with everything you can possibly think of. Uh, I will, you know, make an audiogram with the podcast. I will manage the RSS feed. I will write the show. Anything you feel comfortable doing, anything that you have the know-how to do, include it, um, and that will justify your quote. Um, and it might seem to you like, oh, posting a podcast is really easy these days. Like, it's so easy. You just need to upload it and put in the, the text or whatever. But for a client that that may not seem easy, they may not know, and they may not want to know. So, um, that's another thing I'd say is, is pad, pad the deliverables. Fair enough. Thank you. Um, Lauren. Yeah. I mean, everything that Noah and Ebian said was true. I don't really have any extra stuff to say, except for setting, set expectations for your clients. Let them know how many re-edits you're going to do. You don't want to be working with someone and they're paying you X amount of money. And then all of a sudden you are spending three extra weeks going back and forth and they're being picky. Um, that is something that you should specify at the beginning. 
always sign a contract to always, always get it in writing because I haven't had this experience, but I've had friends who have not been paid and they've done quite a bit of work. And then that just becomes a wild goose chase. And, you know, you can go to small claims court and all that, but it just, that will wait. It just takes a lot of time. Just get, make, have a contract. You can look up contracts online, talk to other media professionals. They can point you in the right direction. Um, In terms of setting a rate, you know, I like to look at it and say, this is the work I need to do. This is the time it would take me to do it. Is what they're offering me, if they give you an offer, um, worth it? And if it's not, I say, no, thank you. Um, But if it is or something I'm passionate about, I can talk to them about it. A lot of times I'll talk to, especially in filmmaking, a lot of that in indie films, especially documentary, a lot of those rates are lower. Um, And I talk to them about their budget. I talk to them about what the end goal is. And then I say, if this ends up becoming bigger and you get more money after the fact, will you... Is there some kind of compensation that can come from that? But the rate thing, you can Google it. You can see what, you know, the standard is. And then also just talk to people, see what they charge. I get a lot of messages on Instagram, actually. And people ask me what I would charge for this project or whatever. And I think crowdsourcing to set that is really valuable. Thank you. And Emily? Thank you guys. I feel like I'm learning a lot right now because I've never um, really done freelance work because I went right into working for a major Canadian media corporation, I guess, mainstream media. Um, And I definitely would like to do some freelancing in the future, um, you know, and pivot to that someday. But um, so for now, uh, I have had a, a mostly good experience working in the Canadian press, which is a unionized job. So a little bit different stuff there in terms of like the pay is like you come in at a certain pay scale and then every year it'll, you'll get a small bump (laughs) for the most part until you reach a certain kind of seniority. Um, And technically my job is a part-time job. So you'll see that coming in, you know, I know a lot of people who work at like CBC, it's like they have to renew. I'm not sure exactly how it works now, but I've heard people have to renew their contract every three months. So it's, it's like a hard world out there. <laughs> but um, in terms of the Canadian press, it kind of feels to me like one of the more secure jobs, which is why I've been there for so long, I think. Um, it's like, you know, it's kind of as the unionized thing, it kind of feels more secure and I don't have to constantly be re- re-upping a contract. So I started there um, in the studio editor position. Um, and that is kind of like, a lot of people refer to it as an entry level position there. So if you, it's worth honestly, if you want to, if there are any volunteers who here who are wanting to get into the Canadian press or want to get into the broadcasting side of things, that role is actually a really good jumping off point. And you can look at their job postings to see when a studio editor position pops up because it's a huge, um, Brenda, um, who used to work at CGRU now works with me um, there as this as a studio editor as well. Um, so it's definitely um, a place that they've accepted uh, em- employees from before. So it it would show up on you know their radar a little bit maybe. And um, I feel like it's a good place to kind of get your your toes wet if you are looking into more of that line of work. Um, And then from there, I was actually able to transition to the newscaster position. And I did that largely just because I told my boss, hey, I want to do this. And I think she was kind of surprised, like she didn't know that I wanted to go into an on-air position. Um, I think kind of it's a little bit difficult because it is a shift work job and you don't always like get to interact with everyone else in the office like every day. But um, yeah, it was basically just me saying like, hey, I want to do this. So I think that's going, that's important going into a job is to have an open, if you can have an open relationship with your coworkers and your boss and be like, hey, like, I want to try this project where I want to, I'm interested in this um, and not, not be afraid to kind of go outside the status quo a little bit, especially in like a mainstream job like that. Cause a lot of these places have been doing things kind of the same way for, (laughs) well, I'll speak for the Canadian press, like they had been doing things the same way for a long time. 
and they're kind of just now starting to modernize a little bit in terms of like updating the way that they publish content and everything so and uh, there's a lot of like older people there who are kind of on their way out and retiring and bringing in new people so in the past I feel like it's been a little bit mixed there but um there's some optimism going forward um there's still some troubles there like in terms of they really need to up their diversity and um it's kind of disappointing like how white it is there and how kind of skewed older it is still but um yeah that's that's just my experience um being there Okay, thank you. So I'm about to uh, ask each of you some, in, just one individual question. This will be our last question for this part of the um, discussion. So Noah, I actually would like to go back to you. So I know everyone, if I'm not mistaken, has some experience or involvement, has had some involvement with podcasting, but specifically with you, Noah, um, I don't know if you found this, but I find that there's been um, a bit of an influx of podcasts specifically within this pandemic and um i just wanted to know like how do you as a podcaster how do you basically set yourself apart i mean pandemic or not just the fact that there are many podcasts how do you set yourself apart and what advice can you give to anyone here who is interested in entering into that field professionally mm, that's a that's a great question um yeah it, to be really like honest with with you all um I was in terms of my like podcast business, it was my 20, like 2020 was going like in terms of just that business aspect of it, it was going very well until, until the fall. And then it com came to a complete, a complete stop. Um, and so I've been doing a little bit of thinking as to why that is. Um, is it the market? Is it, what I'm doing, combination of both, I'm sure. Um, but one thing I've been thinking quite a lot about um, is that in terms of the work that you can get in podcast production, um, there's really kind of two different streams, I think, as I see it. One stream is trying to be employed by one of the many networks that is out there. Not many in Canada, unfortunately, uh, many in the States, um, many in the UK, not so many in Canada. Um, so kind of marketing yourself as an individual or doing what I've been doing, which is to create a, a brand um, and going after clients um, to do branded work. Um, and what I, think, what I think I was doing wrong um, at least in terms of getting employment was having my, my brand voice magic, my podcast production company way too present in um, what I was showing to potential employers. And what, I mean, this is just speculation, but I figure when they saw it, they said like, this isn't someone who we're going to hire and is going to be 100% committed to working with us on our company, on our project. This is someone who's going to have split focus um, because, you know, they've clearly spent all this time working on this completely different company that is pretty much only them. So it's not, it's not like, you know, I'm going to leave that company if, if that makes sense. So I think, um, I think that's something to think about. Um, who is your audience? Who is your, who are you trying to get work from? Is it an employer? In which case they probably want to see, um, things like, you know, journalism, background or journalism experience or, you know, community radio is an amazing thing um, to have, especially because a lot of the people who now have jobs, jobs in podcasting and are in a hiring position, a lot of them came from community radio, um, certainly public radio in, in the States. Um, or are you going after clients in more of the branded space, in which case they kind of want you to look like they do? which is, um, you know, modern branding, um, you know, full width images on your, you know, on your website, like really kind of um, slick um, and kind of web, whatever, 3.0, whatever we're at. Um, so that's definitely um, something to consider in terms of setting yourself apart is 
I don't think you can be both very effectively. I think you kind of need to be one or the other or completely separate your whatever, your LinkedIn from your Twitter or whatever, whatever it is. I think the best resource I've come across um, for finding work and also um, to support you in, in once you have work um, is airmedia.org. I don't know if, um, if other people are, are aware of this organization, but it's the Association of Independent Radio Producers. It is pretty US centric, but um, they also have um, people in Canada and across the world. And essentially for, I think it's something like $50 a year. And I'm sure they also have um, student prices. They might have um, you know, scholarships or subsidies. Um, th there's an amazing job board with like five, 10 postings a day. There's like all sorts of stuff about rates and yeah anyways um so check that out ebian um one of the things that personally i really enjoyed reading about in your bio was that you have i'm going to quote from your bio a passion for bridge bridging culture and technology <laughs> um that really stood out to me so i know you may have kind of touched on it but just on that specifically how um I guess really like with your being involved in the music department, how do you feel that you're able to do that now? Um, bridge those two things together. Okay, two things. First, um, as a producer, we're often behind scenes. So people don't see your stories or your bylines. So I just wanna add that I worked at Spark, which is CBC's national technology and culture program hosted by Nora Young for close to a year. And it was there that this like love for technology and culture really like opened up for me. It was sort of like a full circle experience because my intro to journalism was music. Um, I worked in community radio. I was working as a music director and I'll be honest, like that wasn't the best job for me, but I learned a ton. Um, and then I, I worked in uh, broadcast radio um, first as an intern and then I eventually got back into radio when I was at Spark. But before that, I was working at CBC Toronto as an associate producer, so working in breaking news. Um, and then I was also just taking like whatever jobs came up at the CBC. So I really had opportunities because people just like passed my resume around. And I think one of the things that have been helpful for me in my career so far is just keeping a good reputation or just doing your work good enough that people remember. So when they need someone, they reach out. Um, so I've been fortunate on, on that front. But um, in terms of like setting myself apart now that I'm like officially freelancing, um, Quick story before I share that, I actually became a contractor because I had to. Like, I didn't really want to be like a journalist who's fully independent and is, you know, picking out my rates and, you know, hustling in that end. Like, because I worked at the CBC, um, I was getting like, um, like benefits as a temporary worker. And then I eventually got a contracted position. Um, well, a temporary gig that turned into a contract position at Spark. So this world of being your own business person is really new to me. And I've just been learning a ton um, in terms of like meeting people who are hiring, how to talk to them, how to leave a good impression, um, how to set yourself apart in more detail, I think is what has helped me is just looking back at the work that I've done and being able to show that. Um, but in terms of culture and technology, I think that's really just like what I've described as my beat. So the stories that I've done at Spark is an example of that. Outside of journalism, I am an event um, producer. I don't really share this in the journalism community because it just feels so separated from the work that I'm, I'm doing as, um, as a journalist and a, like a podcast producer now. But I started this group called Ahe, and it's an events group based in Toronto for Black Muslims. And we created this um, event actually based on a hashtag called Blackout Eid. It goes viral every year. And really what it is is Black Muslims take photos of themselves and like post it on the internet. So I had the idea, why don't we make this like virtual phenomenon, like an actual event. So we partnered with North by Northeast um, and made it like a, a music event. So we had 
all kinds of artists performing. They were all Black Muslim women um, artists who were performing. And I think that's a perfect example of just like bridging technology and culture. Um, it's not exactly journalism. And I, I think it's exciting because like this pandemic has sort of just like forced us into new ways of telling stories. Everything like has to be online because you can't go anywhere. So this like love for technology and culture, I think is really just like where storytelling is going. We don't just think about our you know, physical interactions anymore. We think about how we look online. We think about our social engagements as like a way of engaging with people. Thank you. Um, so next uh, it is for Emily. Um, again, I know that you've, you've kind of touched on it, but I wanted to speak about um, what is the biggest difference between working uh, full-time at the Canadian Press and then community radio at CJRU? And do you feel specifically, do you feel like you were prepared? So I think the biggest difference is the uh, creativity that you and the freedom that you do get working community radio to explore projects that you are passionate about. Um, I think it's different at every organization. In my specific role, it's very um, workmanlike, the work that I do. Um, So you show up, within a certain set of hours and you do a certain amount of work, I have to get my newscast out every hour and I write up a news watch every hour for the most part. Depends on the shift, it is shift work. So sometimes I'm doing an overnight shift or sometimes I'm doing early mornings or late evenings. Um, But yeah, it is just very much, um, you're looking at the news of the day and you're uh, digesting it and um, presenting it in in a radio format every hour. Um, and I think that's what I actually really miss and what, um, what I love about doing community radio and other projects, um, and podcasting is like, you have more of the storytelling aspect and you can really delve a bit deeper into the story. I definitely had to learn so much coming into the Canadian press. Um, I think having the big thing was being very detail oriented and being very, um, like super aware of like CP style and everything. Um, those, that was probably the biggest thing. And, um, working to deadline was like a really big thing too. And part of the job that I had at CGRU was a big part of that. So CGRU helped me kind of like learn to work to deadline and to, um, uh, definitely write scripts and stuff like that. And also just speaking on air was a big thing. A lot of people, when they first come in, they're a bit nervous to just even be in front of a microphone. Um, and I think just having that experience of and growing more confident speaking on air was really big. Thank you. And lastly, Lauren, uh, the question that we wanted to know is, how did your audio experience, how does that translate into your career in documentary film? I think any experience in media helps any experience in media. Um, I mean, specifically thinking about CJRU, it, like I mentioned before, the product management part is a really big thing that I think can be translated across everything that I do um, in audio and podcasting and everything that I do. Again, interviewing is extremely important. I would say probably the most important thing that I do to create these stories Um And that experience that I got doing that for audio work and whatnot really helped me hone my skills for interviewing with a camera. If you're able to make someone comfortable um, as an interviewer, that person's going to come across on the camera so much better and so much more engaging um, and also through podcasting and whatnot um, than if they're rigid and nervous. Um, And then in terms of audio editing, I think one thing that's really, you know, especially in film school that's not focused on is how important audio is. And my professors have told me this, I've had colleagues who've told me this, that you can have a beautifully shot film, but if you have sound that's horrible, people will not stay to watch it. Um, If you have great sound and okay visuals, people will stay, they'll watch your film. Um, And I think, you know, having the ability to record really high quality audio, having that ear when you're recording to get that audio, to get those background noises, to be able to build soundscapes, to build 
scenes and podcasting can really show you how you can create different moods and transition between things and how sound is an element of storytelling, um, background sound, and then also being able to source sounds. Um, a great website uh, that I use is Epidemic Sound. It's a pretty cheap, it's, you do have to pay, um, but it's a huge library of, I think it's like $20 a month or something, but it's a huge library of music and sound effects. And I use that all, all the time. But one thing I think is really good, I and mean, if you wanna get into listening to, or get into building soundscapes, being a big sound editor, um, is by listening to podcasts you enjoy and listening to different media and really learning the different aspects of it um, and playing around with it. And CJRU would give you the opportunity to play around with creating creative things like that. And yeah, so I think, you know, audio is so integral with documentary storytelling. And in that sense, it's really helped me create really captivating um, films. For myself, um, I started working while I was in school. So my first internship, which was at a company, well, a music publication um, owned by CHCH called Chart Attack. I got that opportunity because I reached out to the editor of the publication because I knew that I wanted to get into music reviewing and uh, music criticism. And so I just said, hey, I'm a journalism student at Ryerson and I'm just like eager to get some experience. And um, luckily he said that they were looking for somebody. So I just got the internship opportunity because I asked. And um, after that, um, I actually met someone who used to write for Exclaim. Uh, I asked her to like meet for coffee. And because I, again, I was just like so curious about like the world of just like music reviewing and, um, just culture stories in general that I wanted to know what it was like to be like, you know, a reporter or a journalist telling these stories. And so because I met her, she passed my resume on to um, an editor there. So that's how I got my like first freelancing opportunity. It was like my first paid like journalism work, but like, I don't want to talk bad about the company, just like freelancing when you're starting is so bad in terms of rates that I sort of just said yes to whatever. Um, because I just wanted experience. Um, so I would say that would be like the first thing I did, which is just like take the initiative to reach out to the people that you want to be working for and or people that are doing work that you admire and want to sort of align yourself uh, to be doing down the line. I think it's a great way to learn what the market is like, but also hear like firsthand experience from people who are um, working journalists. And then also I think my break into journalism was after I had my internship at um, CBC's As It Happened, which fortunately for me, I got because I, um, I'm pretty sure like the internship process at Ryerson is you do well in a course and you have like a couple recommendations from teachers and then that's how you get the opportunity. So luckily I did well in um, TV journalism class and I was also volunteering at CGRU. Um, so that helped me too. And then, yeah, that's pretty much how I got the internship at the CBC. And I was also working at the Star um, Radio Room for a bit too. And just after that, it just was like opportunities after opportunities because I had worked on one program and there was a need for a show. So um, they sort of just like reach out to whoever's available. And that's sort of what my experience has been just saying yes and being open to new opportunities. But now I'm sort of at a place where I'm like, I've gathered enough skills to know what I'm good at, to know what I really want to be doing, the sort of stories I want to tell, the beat that I'm like most interested in. So um, from here on, like my, my goal is to be a bit more picky and selective with who I work for and making sure that I'm like really aligning myself with the work and I'm not just like building my skills anymore. Number one was um, thousands in my university education, <laughs> student loans, man. Um, but having that degree probably was, is one of the biggest door openers as I, I'm not saying you have to have that degree, but in terms of like my current job, it has been. 
And then number two was just sleep because shift work is hard and it does definitely run me ragged at times. And I'm not saying you should go without sleep. If you can find a job that gives you normal working hours, I mean, go with it because it's really brutal. <laughs> Those are my two. You know, I moved to a place I wanted to live and that's in the mountains on the coast and I'm making it work and I'm just like this. So I guess in a way my career might have <laughs> suffered a little bit, um, but it all seems to have worked out um, and I'm determined to stay here. But yeah, and just going after the things you want, it's going to take time. It's going to take unpaid money or unpaid time. Um, you finding money. So it's just, you know, writing grants and stuff, giving up a night of going out with your friends and sitting down and filling out an application and all that. I've had to give up a certain amount of my passion. And I know that's kind of, I don't, I don't know how that lands on everyone. Um, but uh, I went from making a podcast about sandwiches to a podcast about um, the workforce development sector, um, you know, uh, internet, speeds, um, a whole bunch of topics that I have no personal um, connection to or excitement about. Um, and it wasn't until recently, in the last couple of months, that I've started doing a show for myself again. And that's really kind of brought the joy. So um, I, I think if you want to do what you love for a living, um, to, to a certain degree, you're going to start loving it a little bit less. Um, I think maybe that's a little bit cynical, um, but it, it kind of comes with it, but um, never fear because you can, once, once you have a little bit of time, you can, you can, you can find, find that love again, that passion again. I think initially I'd say sleep when I was working at the radio room, like we literally did overnight shifts. And this was the summer where I was a music director. And I remember I had to like, open on a Saturday and I didn't sleep. Like I just came from an overnight shift and I literally slept um, in the park. Like I took a quick nap and then I went to CGRU to open and like nobody came. And I think that experience for me sort of just like reinstated how much like I love what I do. I think that's like the biggest sacrifice is that you sort of just do what you have to do to get the work done. Um, now I would say what I've given up is sort of um, the consistency of work. I think what I like what I remember when I was in journalism school, I, I put a lot of pressure on myself. Like I felt like I had to constantly have work, but the reality is that journalism in this market is really just unpredictable. Like there aren't that many jobs. So you might have dry spells and I've had to like literally, you know, be resourceful or like start other work for myself so I can, you know, pay my bills. And I think those are really good skills to have to be agile and to think outside of journalism because the industry is changing. Like we're seeing this big podcasting boom, even though it's been around for some time. But I think that is because, you know, journalism is, as an industry is shrinking and you have a company is that want to create their own stories and their own like branded, you know, content. And that's really essentially like marketing, you know, their company. So um, as journalists, I think there's opportunity to be in this new world of like hard news. And if that's not your thing, just like storytelling that is um, based on reality, but also with like a dash and flair of some marketing and, um, a little bit of like, why might you want to buy a product, even though you're listening to a podcast about a person who, I don't know, like, um, had a completely different experience, you know? Um, so I think to summarize, there is such demand in storytelling in general right now, um, that as journalists, like you don't have to just do hard news journalism. Like you can sort of just like steer away from that and do some work that's a bit more creative. 